My name is Lisa McCormick with the UAB Counteract Research Center of Excellence in Arsenicals Research Education Corps. Welcome to today's Grand Rounds Seminar. For those of you not familiar with our center, it is led by Dr. Muhammad Athar, and the goal of the center is to develop mechanism-based, highly effective medical countermeasures against arsenical chemical warfare agents. On August 19th at 12 noon, Dr. Athar will be presenting on molecular mechanisms underlining cutaneous chemical burns caused by arsenical exposures. We will be sending registration information for the seminar as we get closer to the date. But meanwhile, please go ahead and hold this date and time on your calendar. And for those of you involved with the NIH Counteract Program, please remember to save the date for the next NIH Counteract Network Research Symposium, which will be held December 6th through 8th. Registration will open for this event in September and we will send the registration link once it becomes available. For more information on our center or its activities, please visit our website at uab.edu slash or send us an email at as33 at uab.edu. On the website, you will find information on future events and links to recordings of past Grand Rounds presentations and our podcast. Now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Neera Tawari Singh. Dr. Tawari Singh is an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology and affiliated faculty at the Institute for Integrative Toxicology at Michigan State University. She received her doctoral degree from the School of Life Sciences at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, but mainly carried out her doctoral research under the German Academic Exchange Service Fellowship at the Institute of Molecular Genetics at Labnitz University in Hanover, Germany. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Colorado State University and then a research associate and assistant professor at the University of Colorado, Denver. With an extensive background in molecular biology and toxicology, the long-term goal of her research is to pursue basic and translational research to develop countermeasures and targeted therapies against toxic chemical and environmental exposures, including vesicating agents, urticants, pesticides, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that can cause harmful effects and mass casualties, as well as long-term illnesses and diseases to the human population. Her lab focuses on understanding the mechanisms of toxicity and inflammation from mainly dermal and ocular exposures to toxic chemical agents. Dr. Tawari Singh is a principal investigator in both the NIH Counter Act and the Department of Defense programs. She is also serving as a dermal toxicology expert on the Scientific Advisory Board for the National Center for Toxicological Research at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. She has an extensive, or she has extensively published her work and received numerous honors and awards, including the Society of Toxicology's Association of Scientists of Indian Origins Young Investigator Award, the Ocular Toxicology Innovation and Impact Award, and the Dermal Toxicology Best Paper of the Year Award. We are really lucky to have her with us today, Dr. Tawari Singh. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and for talking to us about your work. Thank you so much, Dr. McCormick, for such an extensive introduction. And I am so glad and I'm so happy. It's a pleasure to be here talking at the UAB, um, our Senegal Center of Ex Excellence of the Counteract Program. Um, and I would like to thank you and Dr. Athar for inviting me one more time. And it's, it's a real, real pleasure to talk about my work here today um, that I have been extensively funded from the uh, National Institutes of Health Countermeasures Against Chemical Threats or the Counteract Program. So what today I'm going to talk about is, just give me a second, um, is the toxicity from chemical threat agent phosgene oxime skin exposure. And I'll let you know in detail and, and uh, refresh your uh, knowledge a little bit on phosgene oxime and the chemical threat agents and what is the importance and why we are studying um, the toxicity of these agents. 
So in the present world scenario, I always like to so show this slide first. Um, and due to the number of technological advances and increasing industrialization, uh, we are constantly under the threat of exposure to various kinds of chemical agents that can be really harmful to us. We sometimes don't even know we are exposed to them. However, there can be occupational or accidental exposures to chemical threat agents in an environment where you're working or a sudden leak from somewhere. But however, there is also an additional risk of their potential use in warfare and terrorism as we have seen for a number of years from now. And not only that, there have been recent um, escalations in the Middle East and exposure to a number of these agents. Um, and NIH, the, the NIH's Countermeasures chemical, Against Chemical Threats program has definitely taken a leadership role in pursuing the development of new and improved medical countermeasures against such exposures. Um, and these are mainly to treat the acute and long-term conditions caused by potential and existing chemical threat agents. Um, and these all could lead to developing effective and targeted medical counter, in, countermeasures or interventions, which is a really a critical component of the modern global strategy to overcome the challenges of the chemical emergencies that might occur uh, when these are used, accidentally released, or you have an occupational exposure. So basically, just a little bit about what do we mean by these chemical emergencies and from, from what kind of agents, just with a few examples that can lead to such chemical emergencies. Um, some of these agents can be industrial agents that cause adverse health effects and mass casualties by accidental, occupational, or intentional exposures that can be in warfare or you know, terrorist activities. Um, such things, you know, uh, chemicals can be something like, for example, ammonia, which is used in a lot of fertilizer, petroleum, and other industries. Chlorine, which is a disinfectant that is used in a number of industries, but is also a warfare agent. Hydrogen fluoride that is used in refrigerators, air conditioners, etc., in a number of industries. Methyl isocyanate that is used for the production of pesticides, rubber and adhesives, and uh, there has been a big tragedy reported uh, in 1984 in India where large population was affected and, they, and their children are still affected, you know, when they're born with, with some kind of, you know, symptoms um, of methyl isocyanate. There are a number of pesticides or herbicides that can cause, you know, problems in humans and, and toxicity, um, like glyphosate, etrazine. Coming from industrial agents to real chemical warfare agents that have been used potentially for years as, as weapons of mass destruction or casualties. Um, and I'm sure most of you are aware of nerve agents. Um, these could be tablin, sarin, soman, et cetera. Blood agents like cyanide that can prevent exchange of oxygen between blood and body cells and can lead to toxicity. The number of respiratory agents that are very important chemical warfare agents like chlorine gas, phosgene, chloropicrin, etc. Uh, and one of the most important categories of chemical warfare agents is vesicating agents. Um, like, and these are strong alkylating agents that affect the eye, skin, mucous membranes, as well as the internal organs. And some of the examples of these vesicating agents can be sulfur mustard, nitrogen mustard, levicide, what your center works with, and phosgene oxide. Now, sulfur mustard is one of the most used chemical weapon from Merat since World War I. Um, and phosgene oxide is the least studied of these categorized vesicating agents. Though phosgene oxime is not a real vesicating agent, it is known as a nettle agent or an urticant. It is categorized with the vesicating agent. So what I'm going to talk today most about is phosgene oxime. And I think we are one of the only groups studying this agent right now. And this is one of the most toxic vesicating agents with a great potential to be used in warfare and terrorism. So here, just to show you a few chemical warfare agent related attacks. Um, you would have heard a lot of casualties during the Iran-Iraq war that occurred in 1980s. A um, lot of civilians deceased um, due to exposure to warfare agents. And it was said that most of importantly used was sulfur mustard here. Um, and you can see something like a nerve agent released in, in Tokyo's uh, subway station in 1995. 
And here, most recently, I want to show you where uh, Syrian children were affected uh, with poisonous gas attack in eastern Damas in, in Damascus. So um, it has been very recent, you know, where these agents have been used in warfare. Now, coming to these vesicating agents, what I'm going to talk most about um, are sulfur mustard levicide and phosgene oxide. Uh, phosgene oxime is the one that causes, you know, effects within seconds of exposure. So levicide also causes effects within minutes, but phosgene oxime is really absorbed fast by the body, and the effects are really, you know, painful and immediate uh, after its exposure. So this uh, agent, uh, phosgene oxime, is also known as dichloroformoxamine, permoxime, or CX. Um, it was first produced in 1929 and was stockpiled during World War II uh, as a potentially deadly agent. Um, and though there is no report, but is, it does indicated that um, Iraqis, Iraq used it um, as an agent whose effect resembles CX against Iran. So it is a possibility that it has been used, though it has not been reported. However, there are pretty, some of the reports um, that show or that report that CX could have been used in warfare. Um, now, very recently in March 2019, um, there was a big news um, out there that FBI investigation found a warfare agent inside a modern home in the United States. Now, when they investigated then this agent, they found it to be phosgene oxime. Um, and potentially somebody who synthesized it in their garage was, was thinking of using it somewhere, of course, you know, around in the neighborhood or, or whatever. We don't know that. However, so this showed that how easy it is to synthesize and store a phosgene oxime and how potentially, you know, dangerous it is and how it could be used um, uh, potentially in, in warfare or terrorism activities. So coming to really phosgene oxime, just a little bit of introduction. It is a halogenated oxime. It is an urticant or nettle agent. However, it is categorized with vesicating agents. It's highly corrosive and it has irritating vapor. Um, it has different chemical properties and toxicity when you compare it with the other vesicants. Why? Because it causes really violent effects in humans. It's, it behaves like strong acid too. Um, it is, I mean, nothing, you know, stops from, you know, phosgene oxime from being absorbed into the body really fast, actually. Um, and it can be weaponized with other chemical warfare agents to be used to, cause, to enhance the potential or the potency of the warfare agents being used. Um, and it causes really in instantaneous pain and severe tissue damage within seconds of its exposure. So being one of the most uh, dangerous vesicating agents, it is the least studied chemical warfare agent and is no specific antidote available for the treatment uh, from exposure to phosgene oxide. Uh, information on its dermal absorption and effects on human skin tissue is really limited and its mechanism of action is, not, is unknown. And that is exactly what we are studying in the lab. Um, the skin urticaria from skin resembles urticaria caused by allergic and non-allergic reactions. And I've shown a picture here down here where you can see uh, the phosgene ex oxime exposure in mice and urticaria in humans, how these lesions resemble on the skin where you can really see erythematous ring around um, the exposure side of, of phosgene oxime. And there is urticaria or blanching in the center of, of these, which is observed as urticaria in human or severe allergic reactions in humans that are seen from allergy to different kinds of environmental agents, foods, or anything. Uh, so what are the focus study tissues when someone is exposed to chemicals or chemical toxicity, especially the vesicating agents? Um, so the main routes of exposure to any such chemicals is the skin because it's a maximally exposed tissue in the body and its first line of defense. And apart from that, the eye is severely injured and it's, it's one of the most affected organs from any kind of chemical exposure. exposure. There is inflammation and blindness. Um, and lung injury is another one that is caused due to the inhalation of any chemical. It causes long-term effects or respiratory failure 
and the maximum cause of death is due to the lung injury. Um, so these are the three focus areas in the chemical um, exposures. However, other internal organs are also affected, and I will show how the absorption of CX might be causing um, systemic toxicity and toxicity to other organs in the body, which could be true for the other, um, other chemicals too, depending on their toxic nature. So the CX toxic effects, it's, since it's readily absorbed in the body, um, the immediate effects are on the skin, eyes, and the respiratory tract. Some of the things are reported that happens within seconds. However, the exact mechanism and how, you know, uh, their toxic effects of CX are um, happening in the skin, eyes, respiratory tracts, and, and internally in other organs is not no known at all. So what we're trying to do is first study uh, what's going on from exposure to the skin to this agent. So we are um, conducting um, skin exposure studies with CX. So for this, we had to have, we had to have to develop a relevant CX cutaneous exposure model of injury for that we are using mice. And we want to elucidate mechanisms of skin damage and inflammation and further examines its systemic toxic effects. We want to identify novel targets that could be explored for therapeutic intervention. We want, what is the profound impact of understanding these effects, these toxic effects, pathology and related molecular mechanisms of CX induced toxicity. And this all study is going to have a significant translational impact towards designing prevent intervention strategies further or countermeasures. So because CS decomposes sp spontaneously, its melting point is around 40 degrees centigrade. It's like 37.7 to 40 degrees. And for reproducible dermal exposures, um, concentrations of CX was very important for it to be in a liquid form was also very important. So we kind of tried to have a exposure system developed. Of course, we can't use CX in the laboratory settings. We cannot have, you know, develop any kind of exposure at the university where we are. Um, so this is being done at MRI Global. So MRI Global has facilities to use these agents, to synthesize these agents, and they're approved to do such kind of exposures for us. Um, so they developed an exposure system at MRI Global. Um, and what they did was they created a warm system where things were warmed up to, to have uh, CX remain at 40 degrees centigrade um, and have that at particular temperature concentration so that we can get reproducible dermal exposure. So as you can see here, we had two, um, you know, exposure, vapor exposure caps put on the dorsal skin of mice. Um, and then within, a, and we did it for a few seconds and I'll, and I'll talk about the exposure paradigm very soon to you guys. Um, so these were exposed on the dorsal skin and you can see with only two, caps on the dorsal skin of mice, we saw not only toxicity, but also death in the mice really, really fast. So coming to the study paradigm, we used SKH1 mice for in our initial studies. So over long, what we call an acute exposure was for one minute for, for a phosgene oxime of 10 microliter, which was placed in the vapor cap. And two vapor caps of 12 millimeter was used, were used on the dorsal skin of mice. For short or chronic exposures that we could call it, it was for 0.5 minutes. Um, and the clinical assessments for both of them were carried out like as early as, you know, 0.5 hours or half, 30 minutes um, after exposure to CX in the one minute and two hours up to 24 hours because we saw a lot of death between eight and 24 hour time point. And for the longer assessments of, of, uh, of the toxicity, uh, we use 0.5 minute exposure where we not only did clinical assessments at two hours, one day, three, seven, and 14 days, but we also collected mice at two hour, 24 hours. And I think it's missed here, but also at, at 14 day post exposure. Um, and we'll show you data from the assessments uh, from these time points. So in terms of survival curve, as I mentioned, uh, following one minute exposure, we saw only 20% survival. And with 0.5 minute exposure to CX, 100% of mice survived. 
So following one minute CX exposure, I, the heart rate really dipped um, uh, within you know, 30 minutes to two hours. There was a little backup coming back up, but I think the mice did not survive uh, in one minute. Most of them, like um, uh, most of the mice, only 20% survival rate was observed. In terms of body temperature also, within 30 minutes, we observed a great uh, drop in the body, body temperature of these mice. Um, so coming to the clinical lesions, what we observed, so exposure of duration of one minute, as I mentioned earlier, we could see blanching immediately within 30 minutes. I mean, when we take out mice, even from the exposures chamber, you can see at that point itself that there is blanching, there is a ring, there is an erythmus ring as soon as we take them out also. So within a few seconds, you can see these developing. So the injury is instantaneous and very early as soon as you expose these mice to CX. However, in the long term, as we go, we can see there's formation of crust on the top of the skin. Um, there's scabs, you know, scab formation, and these slowly fall off, dry off, fall off, and there is healing. And probably we feel that in most of the female mice, we saw the healing was a little faster um, than in male mice, but we need to see even for a longer duration to see if that is true. Um, and coming to the measurements of clinical lesions, of course, we measured these in terms of skin bifold thickness. We saw the erythema. We saw the edema in these mice, not at not only at one minute exposure, but also at 0.5 minute exposure. And you can see that the increase uh, within two hours is seen in all these parameters, which is almost maximum um, at two hours. So within two hours, we see in most of these cases, erythema, edema, and skin bifold thickness go up. Uh, these either remain going up like edema or necrosis that we see after, you know, of course, I think necrosis comes later in, in, you know, after exposure, but these parameters are seen within two hours of exposure to CX, which is seen much later in terms of sulfur mustard exposure, um, which is one of the main vesicating agents. Um, so CX exposure, following CX exposure, we saw increased epidermal thickness at two hours, as I mentioned, the maximum increases started within 30 minutes, but two hours was the time point where we'd really see a thickness in the skin measurements in the clinical parameters too, in terms of um, edema and skin bifold thickness measurements. We see that even in here, not only in one minute CX exposure, but also, um, you know, in, in the 0.5 minute, we saw this go back to 14 days, where of course, you know, the proliferation is high at 14 days after injury. Uh, where you do see this increased epidermal thickness at 14 days post-exposure. Um, in terms of dermal plus hypodermal thickness, um, in one minute exposure, as you saw in the clinical parameters, uh, two hours and up to eight hours, there was an increase in dermal plus hypodermal thickness seen in this mice. CX ex, uh, skin exposure also increased dermal plus hydrodermal thickness when you know you give it for 0.5 minutes also. Um, so not only you know as we saw in dermal thick, as epidermal thickness we did not see an increase at two at 24 hours, but the total and overall thickness that comes from dermal and hypodermal, um, you know we saw an increase within two hours of CX exposure and that lasted till 14 days after exposure, as you can see here. So as I mentioned, by 14 days, um, you see scab formation. So we did look into 14 days because that is the lower exposure time point that we could go up to 14 days. Um, and we did see enhanced scab formations, as you can see here, that's observed in the clinical observations. Um, and also hyperkeratosis, uh, an increase in hyperkeratosis, as you can see here um, at 14 days post-exposure. Now coming to all these clinical parameters and what we are seeing, and it's resembling something like, uh, you know, allergic reaction when there is urticaria in humans from various allergic, you know, stimuli and stuff like that. So we all know that in urticaria pathogenesis, um, mast cells play a very important role. Uh, and mast cells mediate inflammatory responses in these allergic reactions. So we thought that we don't know what's going on as a mechanism from exposure to CX. However, we feel that mast cells could play a really important role um, in, in the pathogenesis from CX exposure. 
Um, so degranulation of mast cells, just, um, you know, these mast cells are granulocytes, which are part of immune system. And the degranulations when mast cells are activated release histamines, TNF alpha, tryptase and chymase, proteases, amines, um, and release of mediators, including cytokines, um, chemokines, growth factors, et cetera, TNF, interleukins, VEGF, um, et cetera. And these all can lead, you know, to activation, whatever we observe in the skin, like erythema, veal, the different kind of infiltrates or inflammatory, you know, um, infiltrates like neutrophils. And, and we'll, I'll show you that, how we see all these in the skin, in the histopathology. Uh, but we, we felt that maybe mast cells play a really important role in, in, the, in the mechanism of CX mediated skin effects and not, not only skin effects, but into the systemic toxicity. So um, what we feel is when CX is exposed to mice, um, there is degranulation of mast cells and from resting mast cells to degranulated or activating mast cells, there would be release of tryptate, chymase, histamines, et cetera. Um, and they could lead to inflammatory, you know, release of cytokines. They could be reactive oxidative uh, species formations, reactive, you know, oxidative damage. There could be DNA damage going on, et cetera. So we wanted to look at what is going on here. And as you can see, uh, after um, CX exposure, within 30 minutes of exposure to CX, there is increase in mast cells degranulation. They are really activated very early after exposure to phosgene oxime within 30 minutes. I mean, if we could check even with 15 or 10, uh, or, 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 you know, 15 minutes or 10 minutes after exposure, but because we can't take those out of, you know, exposure chambers, 30 minutes is the earliest that we can do. So we followed it up from 30 minutes and we see that degranulation of mast cells occurs that early. Similarly, in the lower exposure time, also the mast cell degranulation, we can see starting at two hours and it goes up to 14 hours. However, in female mice, as I mentioned, maybe there is, uh, there is resolution of injury going on earlier and we do not see uh, that mast cell degranulation so much after um, at 14 day post exposure. Um, and as a, histamine and tryptase is associated, uh, uh, with the release uh, of, of mast cell granules and its activation, um, we can clearly see an increase in histamine um, following the CX exposure in the urine of mice and increased tryptase levels in the mouse blood. Now, I would like to say here that tryptase is one of the biomarkers of anaphylaxis, which happens in uh, in humans after they're exposed to allergens or there's an allergic reaction. Um, so we feel that this could be a biomarker of the VC mice dying really early and whatever symptoms we observe is something like anaphylaxis and that could be going on. And this is one of the markers of anaphylaxis and we do see this going up in mice. Following these, of course, as we know that following these activation of, of mast cells and the release of different proteases and other things, cytokines can go up also. So we did a... Uh, um, cytokine array analysis to just see what could be the array, different array of cytokines that could be going up, um, or there could be changes in these cytokines, um, not only going up, but going down also. So what could, what are the cytokines that are being changed for falling exposure to CX? Um, and in the lower time points and high time points we did. So this is a kind of heat map that I'm trying to show you here. Uh, there were changes in various different cytokines that we observed in both male and female mice. Um, and coming to, we just put them, whichever ones changed quite maximally, we put them on the table um, and we feel that IL-1 alpha, IL-6, CXCL-11 and VEGF were the ones uh, that we saw maximally being affected following CX exposure. Um, and these are of course really important in mast cell related, um, related signaling cascades. So these uh, this shows that mast cell, um, you know, um, degranulation or activation could be playing an important role in CX-induced inflammation. So following this, we also did tryptase and chymase via, uh, via Western immunoblotting. And you can clearly see here uh, that within two, two hours following uh, exposure, you can see um, high increases in, in chymase activity and also in tryptase. You can see right here two at 24 hours 
and within two hours in females, which goes down by 14 hours post exposure. This is tryptase, which is maximum at both are maximum at 24 hours post exposure. So coming to increase in inflammatory markers, um, we did see an increase in COX-2, which, which is cyclooxygenase 2, um, an important inflammatory marker after exposure to CX. Similarly, we see uh, that mast cells can regulate the activity of metalloprotease, uh, proteinase 9, uh, which is an, an important uh, uh, a molecule in the inflammation. And also myeloperoxidase, we see that there could be a lot of, you know, infiltration of inflammatory molecules like neutrophils and MPO is a biomarker um, and a pro-inflammatory, uh, you know, enzyme, which is stored in the azeotrophic granules of these neutrophils. And as it is released, you can see an increase in myeloperoxidase enzyme. So this is exactly what we see here that MPO increases after exposure uh, to CX. So, there is a lot of inflammation going on and we see it following mast cell activation. So that is our theory till now. Um, and CS exposure also causes macro, macrophages, an increase in macrophage here, as you can see by 14 days after exposure using F480 staining, we see that there is huge increase in macrophages by 14 day post exposure. And as they come you know, later into the play in any injury, that is exactly what we see here that by 14 days, there's a huge increase in macrophages um, in the tissue, it's in the skin tissue following CX exposure. Um, now, not only do we see inflammation and as we hypothesize, there is not only inflammation, but there is also apoptosis or apoptotic cell do, that go, going on. Um, and, and then we, we could talk more about the molecules we did after this, but in tunnel assay, we see that within 30 minutes of exposure, apoptotic cell death is observed in the epidermis of the skin. And not only in one minute, even in the 0.5 minute of CX exposure, we see an increase in apoptotic cell death at both two and 24 hours post CX exposure. So there's not only apoptotic cell death, but there is oxidative DNA damage too. So we, we, we thought that, you know, all this, uh, what is ever is going on due to inflammation, due to release of cytokines, and all this could lead to oxidative stress. And we do see oxidative DNA damage, which could be due to the oxidative stress that is being caused. And we see that it is quite early after CX exposure within 30 minutes and use, using A2HDG staining, we did see huge increase in oxidative DNA damage. So DNA is being damaged, but it is due to oxidative stress, um, a lot of it. And not only um, one minute, but 0.5 minute also showed us the same result. Um, so P53 um, enhances, the phosphorylation of P53 enhances, that shows DNA damage. So P53 and H2AX are DNA damage markers. And following CX exposure, within two hours surface exposure or within 30 minutes, like in one minute post CX exposure, we saw a huge increase in phosphorylated P53 um, and H2AX within th two hours. After two hours of CX exposure, we see a real increase. Um, so within 30 minutes to two hours post exposure, the DNA damage markers are seeing being upregulated. Um, so there is huge DNA damage and not only due to DNA damage, there is oxidative DNA damage. Um, and also there is apoptotic cell death that's going on after CX exposure. Um, and this slide is switched, it has to be before. So not only do we see oxidative DNA damage, but we also see lipid peroxidation that was assessed by um, seeing the, um, the, uh, the expression of 4-HNE, that is 4-hydroxynonanil, and it is a common byproduct of uh, lipid peroxidation during oxidative stress. Um, and there is, it's involved in mitochondrial dysfunction, um, and upregulation of activated protein one or AP1, it can also cause that. Um, and it is an important player in mediating a number of signaling pathways and also induce inflammation. So I just wanted to mention this here, this could be a key, key player in a lot of things that are going on that is like apoptosis and a lot of inflammation. And we, and we not only see, um, you know, I just showed one blot here, but 
uh, there is not only uh, you know upregulation in 4-HNE or adduct formations at uh, um, one minute exposure of CX, but also at 0.5 minute of CX exposure, we see an increase in 4-HNE adduct formations. So coming to activator protein one, it is a transcription factor um, and it's composed of June FOS and ADF. It also regulates gene expression in response to a variety of stimuli, which include cytokines, growth factors, stress, et cetera. And we see it going up, um, the phosphorylated C-gen goes up within 30 minutes of within, mostly, I mean, it's aggregated within 30, but we see it here within two hours of uh, CX exposure. Um, in, in male mice and within 24 hours in female mice. Um, so this is, could be an important player and important in the signaling pathway of CX-induced um, um, you know, um, pathogenesis. So MAP kinases play an important role in signaling um, of, you know, in, when they're in chemical exposures. Um, importantly, uh, we did not see an increase in other MAP kinases, but we see an increase in um, MAP kinase is June N terminal kinase, that is JNK. Um, and this pathway generally regulates the activity and expression of key inflammatory mediators, which include cytokines. It also controls apoptosis and phosphorylate C June, which we just saw before here. Um, so we feel that JNK plays an important role in the signaling of uh, phosgene oxide um, injury because this is the only MAP kinase we saw upregulated. Now, in terms of systemic effects, uh, we have tissues exposed from SKH1 hairless mice. Uh, we have studied the systemic effects. So this is something that we already published earlier that I'm showing right here. However, in our current studies, we do see huge effects of even skin exposure and injury in the lungs. Um, and we are studying that currently. Um, so generally what we saw earlier was that there is dilation of peripheral vessels and increased lead red blood cells in almost all the organs we saw um, after being exposed to CX. Um, and this was only cutaneous exposure. Um, so what we feel is that uh, the blood is being accumulated in these organs. Um, and the main injury we found was going on in the lungs. So we are doing that and we are doing some direct inhalation studies also to see what's going on in the lungs following CX exposure. In liver and spleen too, uh, we do see effects from CX exposure. Of course, there is increase um, and dilation of peripheral blood vessels and increased red blood cells in the spleen and liver also. So now looking at what we have seen following CX exposure, uh, we have seen immediate skin lesions, including urticaria, necrosis, blanching, erythema, edema, mortality um, in long duration exposed mice. Uh, we see an increase in skin inflammatory pathology that is going on. There's alterations in inflammatory DNA damage and oxidative damage markers that we saw. Um, and we feel that, uh, you know, uh, mast cells are activated initially and are related to the kind of inflammatory response we see. Um, so in phosgene oxime, when it's exposed to the skin tissue, there could be whatever is going on, there could be early activation of mast cells. Um, and it could be, you know, that the, the apoptosis, the, the DNA damage, and everything that we see from phosgene oxime exposures, it could be Firstly, due to the activation of mast cells, or this could be an independent event, we don't know yet, but I will say that we're going to use mast cell knockout mice to find this out. So activation of mast cells initially could release mediators, including histamine tryptase and cytokines, as we've just seen in all our studies. The different inflammatory pathway, apoptosis, inflammation, all that we see that's leading to, you know, urticaria, necrosis, and other things that are going on in the skin of mice. Um, and of course, not only these, there's inflammation going on, but we feel that there could be some kind of anaphylactic reactions that go on, uh, that mice die within, you know, few hours of exposure to CX. And most of the mice we saw, the mice death we saw was between like uh, eight hours, um, six hours, eight hour, hours mostly. And, and that's in, with, with our experience, not only with SKH mice, one mice, SKH one hairless mice, but also with um, with the black uh, hair haired black mice that we are we are doing C fifty seven black six mice, 
Um, it's like ballpark of six hours to 24 hours that we see maximum death in the mice that are exposed to one minute uh, uh, of CX exposure. So there could be systemic toxicity, re respiratory and cardiovascular compromise that could be going on. Um, so the interventions could be early. We could, you know, block either mast cell activation or release of its mediators. And if there is something else going on parallel, we could also block it. But the first thing we wanted to study was um, that what happens when we have mast cell knockouts, mice. So to validate mast cells as key, key players and identify molecular targets and CX toxicity, are we going to be using mast cell knockout mice? Um, so mast cell deficiency mice will be are being right now being exposed. You know we, we are we are currently doing those studies at MRI Global, um, so they are being exposed to um, CX right now, and we want to investigate whether blocking these targets, you know, mast cells will assist to mitigate CS induced skin morbidity and mortality, especially in the terms of DNA damage and oxidative DNA damage and and all the other, you know you know, things going on, not only inflammation, but also, uh, you know, apoptosis and death and, 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 and uh, um, you know, um, cell death, apoptotic cell death. So it's important to know this is all related to mast cell activation or their parallel pathways that are going on. So we, we see, um, I just wanted to show you quickly that in the black mic six, as in the SKH1 hairless mice, um, in exposure um, of the black six mice, we also see similar kind of lesions within, thir within 30 minutes of exposure to mice. Um, and we put that down here. And as we saw in the hairless mice, we see um, these kind of scabs and things develop and these crusts dry up later. And then, you know, there is healing by 14 day post exposure in the lower of the 0.5 minute exposure of CX. So, um, we are testing for the efficacy studies. As we just said, we want to study first what is happening with the mast cell knockout mice. Uh, but what our proposed efficacy study here is that studies here are that we want to test the FDA approved therapies that can counteract first genoxime induced toxicity by targeting mast cell activation and the release of histamine. Um, so if mice are dying early, we want to give them epinephrine and see if we can revive those mice um, or, you know, stop causing the death of those mice or reduce the death rate in the mice. Um, now, desloratadine, which is an antihistamine, it also has mast cell stabilizing properties um, and is also an antihistamine. So we want to use epinephrine and desloratadine either alone or in combination at one minute to see that uh, we can not only reduce death in the, in, in the, in the animals, but also uh, decrease the skin lesions or the, uh, the urticaria that we see on their skin. Uh, we want to further test the optimal treatment option in C57 black six mice, which we, which we are using right now in mitigating CX induced toxicity. Um, so we want to test both these ones in SKH1 hairless mice and finally in also C57 black six mice before we go to any larger animal. Um, so till now, uh, we have published um, a number of um, papers on phosgenoxime, um, some reviews on phosgenoxime. Um, and if anybody wants to have a look, um, in 2018, we published this paper where there was, this is um, something that we did only, I think, till eight hours of exposure. This was a, a very, um, you know, preliminary paper at that point, a short kind of report preliminary paper on our studies with phosgenoxime uh, that we, we saw that helped us made, make our hypotheses and, and et cetera to go forward for this um, R21 grant with CX and then U01 grant that we have from the Counteract program. Um, we have done two different phosgene oxime um, reviews. Uh, we, in one that we've compared it to vesicating agents, different lesions that it causes, the mechanism of its action, um, and what could be the treatment options that, you know, compared to other vesicating agents, including the, the uh, uh, levicide, et cetera. So that has been discussed in this paper. 
and it's a highly urticant and emer emer emerging chemical threat agent. And you can read a little bit more in this paper. So in this um, issue of toxicology mechanisms and methods, a new and different you know, emerging chemical threat agents have been discussed. Um, so this would be an important uh, uh, you know, um, issue to read for everybody, um, not only um, it toxic industrial chemical and toxic toxic industrial agents both have been discussed in this issue. So there are some important chemicals that have not been generally been talked about or in detail have been discussed in this particular issue of toxicology mechanisms and methods. Um, so also to just give you a little bit that, okay, we were working on this and we got a lot of coverage around here that we have been working because we ours is one of the only groups that is working on phosgene oxime to find not only to find the mechanism of its action, but also to find out the antidote um, of uh, this can deadly chemical agent. So um, here it was a little bit to show that if this antihistamine or you know the epinephrine, the epipen, or you know that can be easily carried with us, uh, could be uh, you know a real uh, you know antidote for uh, this chemical agent. So um, they have been talked about a lot here in 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 Michigan that we are working on phosgene oxime, and I'm very happy to work with this agent. So coming to acknowledgments, I really would like to thank everybody in my lab, especially Dr. Satain Singh, who has worked, who is with a postdoc on this uh, project and has worked a lot um, in, in phosgene oxime and all more, a lot of results are from him. Uh, Dr. Dinesh Goswami, who was working with me at the University of Colorado, Denver. I think I have not have him here, but he, he also has played an important role um, in this. And everybody else currently in my lab, Dr. Swati Sharma, Steve Lundback, Amit Madadgar, um, and some of the students that we have in the lab, lab have all contributed to, to this study. Uh, my collaborators here, Dr. Erica Noland, who is a pathologist, who looks um, a skin pathologist, who helps us do that, and Dr. Adam Moser, uh, who, has, who is an expert on, on the mast cells, and various other people who are, who are helping me now with different other kinds of aspects that we are studying in, that I did not show here right today. Um, and then the other collaborators at UC Denver. So my grant was initially funded at UC Denver, my R21. I started and I moved with that here and my U01 grant on uh, you know, studying CX exposures was then funded further here at, at Michigan State University. Um, so we are studying those things. And then I would really like to thank all our team for designing the exposure system and doing our exposures at MRI Global. Um, so the team have been very important players um, in, in the results that we're showing here. And not only that, I would really like to thank the um, Countermeasures Against Chemical Threats, the Counteract Program for their funding for all this work that we do. Our heroes, of course, the mice that we've used so much in these studies. And NIH, um, NIAMS program and Dr. Sang Hung, Hung Sang, who is our uh, program officer. He's been helpful all the way along with everything um, in, um, in this project. Our um, doctors, Rick Newbick and Ann Dorans, who are the chairs of the department here at Pharmacology and Toxicology, um, and the SCAG School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, also where I started this project. And just to show you our huge campus here um, at Michigan State, uh, we really love this campus. It's really nice out here right now. So these, this picture was taken in 2019 before um, the pandemic started. So there were students and all, we were all together. We were not wearing masks. We, um, you know, chilling out outside also. So a number of them are undergrad students here. This is the Satane Singh postdoc. But these are all the new members in the lab that uh, are here right now, but we couldn't take a group picture. Um, so, this is Steve Lundback, who is a technician in the lab. This is Swati Sarma, who is a postdoc. This is Karen Ryan, Ryan Karen, who is an osteopathic medicine student and is doing work with us. Uh, this is a PhD student in the lab, Omid Madadkar. Uh, this is Anna Monson. She and uh, Fabiola Fertis are uh, summer students in the lab, very enthusiastic, doing a lot of stuff right now in the lab and learning about not only CX, but a lot of other new stuff in the lab. Uh, 
but they are working with a lot of CX tissues right now. So I really thank everybody in the lab and the group. Um, and thank you everyone. And I can take any questions if somebody has, and I can stop sharing now. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. That's wonderful. You're getting a lot of accolades and thank yous for your great presentation. So I just want you to know that everybody's giving you um, many props. We do have a couple of questions. Um, one, do you see a role for COX2 inhibitors like Celebrex as a therapy against CX? Good question. Um, no, we have not tried to see that yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, this is good. So whoever asked this is a good question. Right? <laughs> the problem is uh, for us, you know, because CX is something that we have to, you know, do exposures outside. I mean, we can't work so much in the lab with it to decide which ones to use and how to test this over there. It's, it's a very hard decision. Sometimes it's so expensive to get anything done, you know, at other contract labs and MRA Global. So, I mean, definitely we, we haven't done any, we have done some treatment strategies as, as a part of a supplement, uh, but when we go next year for, ex, for our therapeutic strategy or, you know, doing exposures uh, based on what we see right now, we might, you know, a little bit alter, modulate our strategy or treatment options. But this is a good question and good thought. Mm -hmm. Can you discuss the dose used and model development in terms of human exposures, accidental exposures? Wow, that's a good question. I have not got it here, but it was all calculated based on a very much previous study that was done uh, in lungs, you know, inhalation studies, where they did calculate some doses of sulfur mustard in human exposures. Uh, and before we went for exposures at MRI Global, um, the 10 microliter dose of CX to compare with mustards and other things were taken into account, as well as human exposures that could lead to, you know, lesions. So, and not up to death. So we kind of came to a ballpark where we wanted something that did not cause death and that caused death in humans. So uh, we did calculate this based on human exposures initially. So I don't have those numbers exactly here, uh, but before going for these exposures, we did do those calculations that somehow match the human exposures. But because the human exposures are not so common in this, it was really hard to, whatever was available data in animals or something, we used that to calculate, you know, kind of, you know, ballpark of our exposures because there is no human data available. Well, that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at the NIH Research Symposium in December. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Tori Singh. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. Thank you, Dr. Athur. And thank you everybody, you know, who's in the, you know, Counteract program so for having me there. And it's a pleasure again to give this talk today. And uh, thank you everyone one more time. And see you all at the Counteract meeting in December. Thank you.